look at it actually, and I call it the danger of education. But when you're talking about science, every single day there's a lot of scientific facts. So if you make a theological assumption based on the science of today, let's say this science changes tomorrow. I think that we as an Orthodox Church have to really do our research and know where we're at. I don't think we necessarily have to agree with all those Christians. I don't think we, have, we necessarily need to. How do people who favor evolution from a Christian standpoint, how do they defend it? And trust me when I tell you, they've got some really, really good arguments. How do people who are against evolution are against it and why? And they've got some very valid arguments. Faith is not knowledge. Faith in the unseen in this world is likely. If we had all the knowledge that we would be certain we would not be in this world right now, we would be up there. And surprisingly, that kind of jump from likely to certain, that same faith exists for the believer and the non-believer. So the non-believer, just like the famous book, I don't enough, have enough faith to be an atheist. The atheist sometimes goes on that faith from being likely to certain, say, you know what, I'm absolutely certain that God does not exist. And today, in this weekend, I'd like to give you some more information to really get our sense from a believer to actually believe the outcome. When we search truth in this field, we always start with presuppositions. Presuppositions are what? Are your assumptions, where you come from. If you are anti-God, you know what? You're going to start from that point, no matter what people tell you. You're going to go and have some fact-finding and revelation. And I call it fact-finding. You're going to go as a scientist. You are going to go and find the facts. But there's also revelation, the biblical revelation. Because that same biblical revelation that is in the Bible is available for everyone, no matter what your presupposition is. And then you come up with your beliefs. The problem becomes when we cycle this. When your presuppositions, you've already made up your mind even despite all the evidence that exists. And this is what I would caution you. Despite all the evidence that is given to you, you already made up your mind. No argument is good enough for you. So you have your presuppositions. You go and find the facts and then you end up in your beliefs and those beliefs end up enforcing what again? Your presuppositions that God doesn't exist. That's the most dangerous cycle. And I would tell you very, very carefully, when you are at least debating or when you are actually studying, a lot of us go at the facts and try to look at the facts and debate people with the facts, but we don't realize that they already have the presupposition from before it. So now, I'm going to give you a story of history. If you want to know how did this modern debate come, so when tomorrow we talk about evolution, you have to know how we came to this. And I'll tell you something, you'll find it extremely interesting when you read the history of faith versus nature. And I don't like verses, because verses sometimes puts them against each other. But you look at that history, it is very, very impressive. You know why? Because there are three lines of thought there. There's always the study of God, the theology. How do you look to God? There's the study of nature, which comes by observation, comes by science, and then absolutely embedded into this, your human existence. It is such an amazing, intricate trichotomy that everything you think of in terms of nature will affect how you believe in God. Everything that you think of God and your nature is going to affect how you believe of yourself. I'll give you a very simple example. If I'm a complete naturalist, complete materialist, then you know what? I don't believe in God. And you know what? When I look at human existence, humanity is all what it is. Humanity is all what it is. Now let's start the story from ancient times. In ancient view, from God's perspective, it was a polytheistic society. There were so many gods. You look at the Egyptian gods, you look at the Sumerian gods, you look at the Roman gods, you look at the Athenian gods. There were so many of them. When it came to nature, most ancient people believed that nature was a tool for the gods to either punish them or reward them. That's how they looked at nature. For them, it was so intricately tied to their perception of God. That's why they used to worship their gods. If you always look at the ancient Egyptians, what they would do in some of the feasts, they will take a young woman, throw her in the Nile, so that the flood of the Nile would not damage their crops. That was their perception at that point. And then your perception of yourself, humanity is just a slave to the gods and at their mercy. 
That was the ancient view. And in fact, you'll find it very interesting, and, and some people would actually sometimes balk at this, like, you know what, atheism, in terms of its modern definition, did not even exist in the ancient world. It was not even there. There was a couple of different variations in the ancient view, and this as goes into nature. There was the Gnostic view, which looked at nature in terms of dualism. Nature itself and matter was evil. The spiritual was okay. And that's one of the reasons why the Gnostic heresy in the church was very problematic. Because they did not think that God can incarnate and take our flesh. Matter was evil. And humanity should do everything it could do to get rid of matter. You had the Epicureans who believed that the universe was eternal. When you look at the classic view... So, the first time that this classic view in all the ancient civilizations, which is really amazing, that it would change was in the Judeo-Christian faith. Where in this, God was only one God. And God created nature as a gift and a blessing for humanity. And humanity was made in the image of God. That was the first time in the history of civilization that nature became a tool of blessing, not a tool, a whipping tool from the gods to people. This viewpoint dominated from the time of Christianity spread to almost the medieval times when you get Augustine, who actually said the four points. When he looked at truth, Augustine said it very clearly. You know what? There is no dichotomy of truth. There is no scientific truth or natural truth versus the biblical truth. It's all one truth. You can't have confusion. There are two books of truth. There is a book of scripture and a book of nature. There is the Bible and there is nature in front of you that God has given to us. He's the first that said that both books need interpretation. He was the first that said, you know what? In terms of the biblical interpretation and nature, you've got to be careful. In fact, Augustine was one of those that said at that time, if our biblical interpretation, not the text, if our biblical interpretation collides with a scientific accepted fact, in the age that we live, our interpretation has to be revised, but not the text. Very big difference between the biblical text and the interpretation. At the end, in terms of those two truths, the spiritual facts are superior. But he said something very, very beautiful. I believe so that I may understand. And I understand so that I may believe. There is no conflict. There's not you're living a life of a student in college and enjoying your, your, your rationale and your logic and your sciences and the beauty of what is given you. And then you've got another life here in the church. They're not separate. You believe that you may understand and you understand that you may believe. Things started to get a bit messy in the Middle Ages because at that time when people looked at God... They looked at naturalism, which believed that, you know what, nature was all in all, that's what it took. Versus other people who looked at supernaturalism, that every single thing, if it rained, it was God. If it didn't rain, it was, God, it was God as well. So people went from the extreme of being supernaturalist to the extreme of being naturalist. And in between, there was this whole concept of occasionalism. When does God interfere in nature? The problem is that they started to realize, well, is God the primary cause of nature or is he a secondary cause? Until you got to the 16th and 17th century showdown. You got Copernicus. And Copernicus at that time said, you know what, my science doesn't make sense that the earth is at the center of the universe. It is the sun that is at the center of the universe. And then it took another generation until Galileo came. And then they had this big debate on the verse in Psalms 104 verse 5. He set the earth on its foundation, it can never be moved. And that's what Galileo was trying to tell the church at that point. Yes, there are a lot of modern depictions right now of Galileo being persecuted by the church. It is not as bad. There's a lot of people just fueling that conflict. But there is no question that there was a tension between the interpretation of the text and the scientific evidence. Because the church at that point, the interpretation, they said that, you know what, our interpretation that the earth doesn't move. And Galileo would tell them, well, based on what Copernicus did, based on all the observations we're seeing, the earth is moving, guys. And in fact, it's the sun that is the center that we are moving around. But at that time, this was the first time on a big scale, 
You got to really be careful with this because this is very important in the history. On a big scale where you start to see a split between the scientific community and the church. Because prior to this, all the scientists were actually people anointed by the church. They're in fact endorsed by the church. In fact, a lot of things, the scientific findings they will get, the church would take it, look at how wonderful and beautiful our God is. And the church and the science were actually going hand in hand. But this was the first time that there was a conflict between them. And then you come to the Enlightenment, the 17th and 18th century. And you find a complete revolution in the findings of natural laws. You find Bacon, Boyle, Paley, and Newton. All those guys, what did they do at that time? They figured out mechanisms. You find geology. Nicholas Steno at that point started to come up. The first dinosaurs, he started to look at all these fossils and bring them up. And all of a sudden, they start to look as like, you know what, this is not making sense. What Newton did at that point, he figured out a law of nature. And then they came up with what's called uniformitism. What is uniformitism? Is that if the laws are uniform, if I'm seeing it here, it should apply there. So if I, the apple, drops from the tree here, because of the law of gravity, then over there, this apple tree, the apple should fall. And it fell now, you know what? A hundred years ago, it should have fallen also. Because the laws are what? Uniform. So then, this guy Steno started to make some kind of a little bit of problem. Because he would say, well, you know what? You look at the rocks, you look at the fossils, you look at the soil. When he tried to duplicate how they would layer, he found that it was taking a lot more time than he anticipated. So he said, if the current rocks and the current sediment is layering at this rate, and I see a rock with all these layers, then this rock is probably about forty to 50,000 years old, not 6,000 years. So all of a sudden, laws of nature are being found, and these scientists are saying, if it's a law of nature, it should apply everywhere, anywhere, all the time. Hence, you get, in the same time, Bishop Usher of Ireland said, based on his calculations of the biblical text, the beginning of creation occurred on Saturday, October 22nd, 4004 BC. In fact, he said in his book, it was in the evening of Saturday, October 22nd, that's when creation started. You see the conflict? You get some scientists who are actually very, still very close to the church. But then you get somebody who's announcing something that is completely opposite to that. And then it gets worse. Here when the fun starts. Why? Because the mechanisms are found. The mechanisms are related to what? Materials. Related to laws of nature. And this materialism ends up being determinism. What does determinism mean? That you know what? If you are on top of the building and you jump off the building, you are determined to fall. So laws of nature are what? Are determined. And if they are determined, what has God got to do with that? Right? So the, the split in the thought process is coming to this. And then you get at that point all the enlightenment people, skepticism, man is more knowledgeable, empiricism, empirical, like you know what, you have a theory, give me an empirical proof of that. Rationalism. All of a sudden you get this dual. There is something called faith and something called reason. And by the way, reason is far more what? Enlightened than faith. You end up with something very, very, very troubling. It's the first time that you find this term called deism. What is deism? It is a belief in God. It does believe that God exists. But it, th it believes that God set the earth, set the laws, and just removed his hand. He's not involved. He set the law of gravity, and that's it. Gravity takes over. He set the law of motion, and it's over. He set the days and night, and then it's over. Deism is basically a removed God. So what is the first step in atheism? You make God what? Irrelevant. No use of no, You don't have a use for him. He said the laws, and that's it. What caused this to happen is that when we discovered, when they discovered the laws of nature, 
And then you get this really interesting complex dilemma. When you see an organism that is so beautiful, you find somebody like Mendel, Mendel who is a monk, who looks at the genetic inheritance and he looks at it as like, wow, this is so cool. And then you find William Paley who actually talks about, you know what, the watchmaker. If you, he makes this analogy, if you are going on the shore and then you find a rock and on this rock there is another rock, well, you'd say, you're not going to say, well, who brought this rock here? Why? Because it's in its natural habitat, right? It's just a rock and a rock. But let's say you find a watch, and you find the watch on the rock. You are not going to say, well, it just came on here. You're going to say, who made this watch, and who brought it over to this? And that's why he was called at that time that God was the divine watch. You know, he made the watch, the watchmaker. So then by analogy, whenever you see a complex organism, whenever you see something that is really intriguing in terms of an organism, you would attribute it to the divine watchmaker. But then you get somebody like Darwin, who didn't necessarily agree with that. It's kind of very interesting when you look at actually how the, the history of sciences evolved. The natural sciences, so physics, laws of gravity, laws of motion, laws of astronomy, came first. But then you get biologists who looked at this, well, you know what, if the astro astronomy has its laws, and gravity has its laws, then biology has its laws. And that's what Darwin asked. He asked, can there be laws for biology that do not need an intervention of God? And that's when he came with the theory of everything, and it became a big debate. But all of it was coming to the point of, what do you do with a complex organism? Very quickly, we came into the 18th and 19th century. Naturalism, now everything can be explained by natural because we explained astronomy, we explained cosmology, not cosmology, we explained the, the law of um, Newtons, and now we explained even biology. So materialism is there, and if materialism is there, since we can see it, have any one of you seen God? No. But you've seen something fall. So since we can see and we can establish those facts, then the only facts that count are material facts. And that's the certainty of truth. And then you counter this also with, with humanity. Because by the way, you get a philosopher on one side, and this philosopher doesn't like God. So when he sees Darwinism coming up, all of a sudden he thinks of what? I exist. That's all that counts. Now existentialism came. And in the meantime, rejection of supernatural. Humanism is what you end up with. What is humanism? That the only thing certain in this world is not God, is humanity, is you. And at the end, you come up with agnosticism and atheism. Look at such an amazing and intriguing journey. You've started from the, about 400 years prior to that with just a split between God and our understanding of science. To the point saying that, you know what, now science can explain all this, hence I don't need God. And all of a sudden, atheism can come up. Yes, it started about a century prior to it with deism, when you removed God, you put him up there, and you know what, we don't need him anymore. But that was the first step. And then you go into the 20th century where everything is explained. By the way, and here's like, you know, this is what I like about this is that, because all three of them feed over each other. You can be like here where all this leads to atheism and agnosticism. But then you can go in the 20th century where you find people who are theologically starting from atheism. They're not scientists. They're starting philosophically and theologically from atheism. And they would tell you after that, you know what, everything is naturalism. There's no need for God. And there in the beginning of that 20th century is when you come with humanity is all what it takes. Darwinism explains the origin of humanity. And Marxism explained your society and your economics. Hence, everything in your life is explained by us. Do you need God? You don't need God at that point. That was their assumption. It came to the point that it was strict materialism. Death is inevitable. Evil is nature, is natural. Humanity is neither good or bad. The problem is that this was the prevailing thought prior to World War I. 
And they thought at that time because humanity had came up with all these achievements that you know what, everything is going to be absolutely fine. In fact, when you look at the end of the 20th century, just before the Bolshevik Revolution and World War I, there was a sense of euphoria in this whole world that humanity will flourish. Why? Because now we're in the age of reason. We figured out the laws, we figured out the origins. We do not need God. Turn century. You end up with the Bolshevik Revolution. You end up with World War I, you end up with World War II. Right after that. And what started a lot of this? Marxism. Very well known that the Nazis believed, Hitler believed very much in Darwin selection. He thought of the, um, the Jewish race as subpar. And he said, you know what, they don't deserve to live. And that was the ethnic cleansing at that time. So that thought ended up in this. So classic Christianity starts with theism. God exists. Study of nature, it could be either totally designed or naturally evolved. You notice the difference between the previous one. The previous one, the nature was what? Was naturalism. That's it. It is totally evolved. Here in Christianity, there are people who believe that it totally evolved and others who believe that it totally was designed. But what is the starting point? It is very careful how I'm clicking. It started with what? Theism. And then, for them, the nature is either totally evolved or totally designed. But then the philosophy of their human existence is that humanity is good. Evil was after the fall. It was not there from the beginning. God did not create anything that was evil. It was all good. Death was not a necessity. And there is a belief in supernatural. When you get a strict, strict naturalist, strict naturalist, his presupposition is that naturalism, it's all what it takes. Everything is explained by what you see. No matter what you give you about arguments for existence of God, they come out as an atheist. You get somebody who is a belief in God, a naturalist. They believe still in evolution. They don't deny evolution. But for them, the biblical revelation of creation, the literal, the literal sense of it, is not high on top of their list they will come up to become either a deist or a theistic evolutionist. Because of where their presupposition... They still believe in God, but you know what? As much as the belief in God is there, the belief in nature is balancing it. You get somebody who is, believes in God, theism, but they absolutely believe in literal interpretation of the Bible. Their presupposition is that if the Bible says so, it says so. End of story. It will be like Bishop Usher, who said that creation started 4004 B.C. And no matter what the scientific findings come, no matter what it is because of their enormous presupposition of biblical literalism, by the way, I'm not saying believe in the Bible. We all believe in the Bible. Believe in the biblical literal interpretation. If it says six days, it is six days. And tomorrow we'll talk about that. But you end up at this point being a young earth creationist. And I'm not advocating this, but you can see that probably there is a balance there. <laughs> There is a balance there. When you believe that theism and context, biblical revelation, context, the letter kills, but within a context, biblical revelation, and then scientific challenges for guided design. You're, you're smart. You're challenging guided design. You're not saying there's no design. You're not saying that evolution doesn't exist. But you're putting a healthy balance together. I think that camp ends up being very well balanced. But you guys realize in this that you can't go out of vacuum and just go and say, I'm going to pick out a book and study arguments against evolution. You can't just do that. It's very hard. You've got to understand the background. And if you're going to understand the background, not only, as I said, in terms of science, but also biblical studies, biblical linguistics, philosophy, theology. If you even want to do your job even better, go and study history, because that history of that debate is unbelievable. Because when somebody comes and tells you, you as a church persecuted Galileo, and because of that, you guys are anti-science, anti-development, you can go back to your history and find out that it's blown out of proportion. Absolutely blown out of proportion. But in the same token, you have to understand how people make up their minds and their thought, and how you make it up. Just remember this triangle. Presuppositions fact-finding, end up in belief. If you are so biased from the very beginning against any fact that you'll find, 
what difference would it make for thee? Even if that fact is against what you believe, at least give it the benefit of the doubt and study it and analyze it and see the pros and cons. If you don't agree with it, at least have a good reason why you don't agree with it. If you as a Christian would come out of this whole three days and come out and say, you know what, George, I'm going to be a young earth creationist. I will fully respect you if you would have done your research and have a good argument why you would do that. If you come out and say, you know what, George, I believe in evolution. I believe in biological evolution. And I believe that God supervised all that. I'll tell you, you know what? I respect you because there are some very prominent scientists in this country who believe in evolution as is and believe in God. And they've done their homework. But I'm going to tell you, when it comes from the biblical standpoint, there are some parts you're going to be challenged with. There are some verses, there are some areas. You're going to have to really do your digging in the theological and, bi and biblical studies to make sense of it. So tomorrow's two talks are going to be very, very balanced in each other. One of them is science, evolution. The other one is biblical interpretation. You can't do one without the other. At the end, your worldview shapes a lot of who we are. Thank you for your attention.